Welcome to Liberty, a European Liberal Forum program where we talk about liberties, liberal values and ideas. I am your host, Ricardo Silvestre. Simone de Beauvoir once said, in itself, homosexuality is limiting as heterosexuality. The idea should be of loving a woman or a man, a human being, without feeling fear, restraint or obligation. Jason Collins, the NBA basket player who came out as gay, said openness may not be completely disarming of prejudice, but it's a good place to start. And with that, I welcome to the conversation Marta Ramos. Marta, thank you so much for coming to Liberty. Thank you for having me. Marta is the executive director of ILGA Portugal, and I asked her to come and talk to us. LGBTQI rights are at the core, a right for freedom to love, for individual decision on how to live, while at the same time striving for a more tolerant and non-discriminatory society. These for examples are the values of the other party and the Renew Europe on the European Parliament. So do you think that these narratives are getting traction, having the effect desired? Is there something different that can be said? Well, it seems pretty easy when you talk about it, right? It, it, we're talking about individual rights and human rights and human dignity. Um, but actually, when it comes to the recognition of marriage equality or same-sex families, we are still very far from uh, acknowledging, society acknowledging, uh, that everyone has the right to love who they want, uh, to have children, um, and to be who they want to be. The majority of countries still don't recognize marriage equality, for instance. We're still in the same-sex partnership or de facto unions or civil partnerships and so on and so forth in terms of recognition of, uh, of uh, family rights. Um, but it is, we are gaining steps more and more um, in different countries and also in institutions uh, for, of this openness. Uh, for instance, uh, the president of the commission for the first time uh, very publicly said um, a parent in one country is a parent in every country. And that is a very strong signal in terms of recognition of uh, same-sex families, for instance. But we still need court decisions. We still need to advocate quite strongly in the streets, in society, uh, in social media, uh, in parliaments uh, for these rights to be recognized, the freedom to love, the right to love. Wonderful. And getting back to the narrative aspect of it, sometimes people say that there's too much in our face. Like, for example, pride. That uh, should be a heterosexual pride. Yeah. Yeah. We've so, so what do you say to that? Is it, is that there's a limit? Is there like a frontier that LGBTQI community should not go through? Or you think it should be openness, complete openness? it should be exactly the same as it is for anyone else. So if we're talking about openness, it's open for everyone, right? It shouldn't be limiting to a part of society, which is considered to be a minority, but who cares? It shouldn't be about numbers of people in terms of community representation. As long as one person is not, uh, um, does not have access to all the rights that she or he or they should have, uh, we should strive for, for that uh, recognition. So in terms of prides, pride are, are incredibly important in terms of occupation of public space. Um, so it is very important. We're still, we still need to go there. So the point of visibility and the developing of the narrative, those two things run together. They run together. If, if you're not visible, you don't exist. So. Absolutely. Um, it looks from the outside that there should be a need to not make these issues political. As you said, they should be not discussed in a way that other things are not discussed. Heterosexual life, political life, social life. So tell me, how do you deal with this? So there's an increased need for activism, but at the same time there is this need to not make this a thing that is always in our minds, always running in the background. So how can we merge these two factors? For example, if you are the executive director of a LGBTQI organization like you are. This is what we hear all the time, uh, that our issues are not relevant, um, that it's not the right time to do this, um, but we still need to, and everything that we do is political. The mere existence of the LGBTIQ community and their visibility is political. Um, so. When we're talking about human rights, human rights are political. So w there's no way of uh, depolitizing these issues. <laughs> 
sure. But still, getting back to your uh, example uh, in particular. In Portugal, we do have it a lot, uh, especially now that there's this uh, thing that people do think that we've acquired this legal status uh, in terms of recognition, that everything is done. And it's not. Uh, in terms of social uh, awareness, we're still very far behind in terms of other, in comparison with other European countries that don't have the same recognition in the law, for instance. Um, but we, we, we continue to strive, we continue to work with political parties, we continue to work with institutions in Portugal and at the European level and even at the international level and when it comes to the UN, for instance, uh, so that these issues are not only um, acknowledged and addressed, but that the, the focus is not per country, it, it is about communities. Mm -hmm. So this means that it, it has an international uh, context that we cannot uh, obviate. Okay. But getting back to the previous question, and that is, even inside the community, are there people that, like there are factions where people want to be like extremely political and others say, let's not make this political, let's make it more like social, or do you see an alignment of the, com the communities are a reflection of society. So you will have people within the community that will say we need to be activists in terms of political activism. And you will have people saying, no, this is not a, a matter to go to the TV or to go to parliament, for instance, in terms of uh, visibility. Um, and we need to address both levels. So we need to make everyone comfortable. So for instance, in our organization, we are an advocacy organization and lobby organization, but we're also a community-based organization. So this means that we run in terms of uh, social uh, awareness and we work with the community within our community center uh, and we do very focused activities for the community uh, but we also uh, bring people from the outside because that's the only way to to raise awareness on on equality that's a great point the uh, bringing people from the outside uh, to our uh, viewers from all over Europe that are listening to us talk about this, how can we reach those people? I'll, for example, an heterosexual man like I am, how do you gather that very important coalition and, and bring those people together to develop that narrative and not make it all the time political, but not making not political? Um, just to give you an example from our organization, we are turning 25 years of existence this oh, year. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, and we focused for the last, I would say, 18, 10, 12 years uh, very much within the community. Now we need to outreach and we need to enlarge our scope. So we need to reach that movable middle, the, the allies, um, because equality is, uh, and human rights is, it's a, a topic and it should be of interest for anyone, regardless if you are part of the community or not. Um, this is this has been the, the, the rationale and the argument in many other civil rights movements, um, but it is very much needed to, to be addressed within the LGBTIQ uh, community and for the community because uh, if you don't bring these if you don't narrow these gaps and, and you don't build these bridges there's always a limit so there's always people who say this is not of my interest so I, w I really don't have anything to do with this. Uh, following the publication of the 2021 annual review by ILGA Europe we see that the LGBTQI community situation in Europe is very heterogeneous and yes, the pun is intended, with success stories in the Iberian Peninsula, in Benelux, in Scandinavia, but at the same time, we have horrible conditions in Eastern Europe, Western Balkans, the Caucasus. How can countries, cities, organizations like yours, individual Europeans, help each other in this struggle? So could there be something like LGBTQI diplomacy? Actually, um, there is such a network in terms of um I don't, I'm not sure if it's a formal or not, but it, it actually exists within ministries of foreign affairs. Um, and there are several other networks in terms of international or national and even local in terms, of, for instance, the European network of rainbow cities, of which Lisbon is, uh, is a member of, um, that actually uh, exist to discuss and to, to uh, narrow the gaps in terms of uh, discussion and awareness on LGBTIQ rights. Um, and it is very important. Um, uh, the only way to achieve and to strive in terms of equality is to build these bridges, is to talk about and to, to, to discuss these, um, these issues, these rights, 
this equality um, uh, in different scenarios, in different legal recognition uh, spheres. So, for instance, Lisbon can build a bridge with another uh, European city and discuss these topics um, and bring even the expertise from the Portuguese case uh, to other countries. And uh, sometimes uh, the strategies for advocacy and, and lobbying uh, within decision-making uh, processes can be replicated in other countries. So these are the types of dialogues that enable um, uh, progress. Um, and this also is important in terms of intersectionality. So LGBTI community is not only LGBTIQ, um, it is also composed of people of color, uh, people of different ethnic minorities, different beliefs. Uh, and these dialogues need to happen more and more in order to achieve equality in terms of uh, horizontally, let's call it like this. Wonderful. There is an example that I would like to bring to our viewers, which is how to make these things happen. There's this really cool uh, data point that I found that ILGA Portugal talked to the Portuguese government and tried to make pressure on the government of another country, which is Poland. So uh, tell me what was behind that? How can that be replicated in other countries in Europe, in your opinion? As I mentioned, we work uh, in networks. So uh, civil society is organized uh, through ILGA Europe, which we are members of, um, in terms of helping um, other civil society organizations. When um, the, the, the crackdown on LGBTIQ rights uh, started in Poland, it became really uh, visible that there was a need to put international pressure. Um, and this has happened in multiple circumstances, so not, not only in Poland. Poland is the latest yes. case, unfortunately. Uh, unfortunately. Yes. Yeah. Um, but it became very... Um, the, what, what, what I mean is that it, we cannot discuss equality and we cannot say that we are such a progressive country if we only uh, talk about the LGBTIQ rights here Absolutely. in Portugal. So we need to use any type of possible forum to discuss these issues. And that's what we ask the government. Please exert the pressure that you can in whichever forum you can um, to help uh, bring dialogue uh, and equality in Poland, because organizations like ours cannot operate at, at the moment in Poland. It is, uh, we're talking about uh, life risk. Um, so it is important to discuss these topics. So one more question on this, because I, I, I think it's important for us to, to talk about practical things. So people looking at this can make practical decisions. So when the resources are limited, in Ilga Portugal or anyone else that is uh, watching this, how do you make those decisions? Because there are so many problems to attend to. Is, that, is there a calculation is because of those networks that are established? Tell us a little bit how the Sometimes thing goes. it has to do in terms of uh, pressure and the, the, the right timing. So yeah. it, it if, if it's something that will be effective, we'll jump on it, even if we don't have the resources to do it. <laughs> but thankfully with social media, this has actually uh, make it more feasible for small NGOs like ours uh, to actually operate. Um, and we are in a very privileged position here in Portugal because it is quite easy to access decision makers. So uh, parliament is very open. The government is very open. We have a secretary of state which has a mandate to operate in uh, LGBTIQ rights. This is not possible in other countries, but here it is. And we have to be very mindful of this. So we are in a very privileged position to be able to, to exert and to ask for, for intervention in other countries this is not always possible um, but it is in different spheres and we we need to uh, also collaborate with other organizations because for instance for the women's movement they can also put pressure within um, uh, sexual and reproductive rights which also uh, talks about LGBTIQ rights. So these are the bridges that we, we, we try to uh, develop to discuss these matters on a, on a national and international sphere. Wonderful, Marta. Now that we move to the end of our conversation, but we'll keep working on this and uh, European Liberal Forum is always open to this kind of, as you said, uh, joint forces and joint work. But there's been some work done in the European Union at this level. The European Commission, the European Parliament have been doing a valiant effort in trying to make the EU a LGBTQI freedom zone. And I'm going to ask you, in your opinion, how valiant uh, that effort has been. But concrete me measures exist, like the EU LGBTQI equality strategy, specific asylum policies in the new pact of migration and asylum, the code of conduct, 
for countering illegal speech online. Uh, for example, the new Digital Services Act have several provisions to fight hate speech on digital platforms, protection of LGBTQI victims on the EU strategy on victims' rights. There is the creation of the European Parliament Intergroup on LGBTQI rights. And there are strong messages both from the President of the Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, but of course also from the Vice President, Franz Timmerman. So a two-part question, and that is, do you agree with this assessment? And what, even if the assessment is correct, even if this valiant efforts and we're going in the right direction, what else can we do? It is correct. Um, and especially the, the, the last few years, we've made huge progress because these issues are also more visible. So this is kind of a, a, an ongoing situation. Um, the problem is the implementation of these strategies and the, actually monitoring this implementation and holding states accountable for not uh, introducing legislation when they have to, of not actually enabling civil society to, to perform accordingly, of not uh, developing funding for LGBTI organizations. Um, these are all issues uh, that are addressed on a regular basis and the LGBTIQ equality strategy has been uh, an advocacy effort from uh, civil society for many years within the institutions. Finally, we have it. Let's see how it will progress. Um, but these messages and for instance, the, the, the LGBTI uh, freedom zone uh, that was just declared uh, uh, from the resolution of the European Parliament, it is a very strong signal, especially for countries that are uh, actually undermining and um, putting pressure in it is what it is. It's a crackdown on LGBTIQ rights and, and operation of, of society organizations. Um, but it's not, it's not enough. It, is, it's, it sends a very strong message, especially for the LGBTIQ community, uh, signaling, yes, we are here and we are here for you. Uh, but we need to, to make, uh, we need to monitor the next steps. So we need to, to make state, member states accountable and the institutions accountable for what they have developed and how they are implementing. So this is, uh, the monitoring process uh, is something that it's very, very relevant in terms of human rights um, discourses and dialogues and strategies. Um, and we will be following very closely how it will progress from now on. But it, Indeed, these are very strong signals. These are only the first, and we are in 2021. Um, so, uh, well, never better late than never. But yes, yes, we need to speed up. But we need more than that. That's absolutely, the thing. Absolutely, absolutely. But there are key points, which is, for example, family rights, health rights, uh, gender identification. So again, as you were saying, good steps have been taken, but we need to monitor them even better and to expand them to this kind of situations, right? Yes, we have countries um, within Europe, not EU, but within Europe, for instance, the Council of Europe sphere, um, where countries are discussing constitutional changes to prohibit marriage equality, where um, gender recognition, legal gender recognition is uh, inadmissible. Uh, where surgeries for trans people are not available. Um, even within the EU sphere, uh, trans rights are still very far behind uh, in terms of acknowledgement of the importance and the steps that are needed to make it horizontally uh, equally and accessible in every EU state. Um, and these are uh, issues of concern because we're talking about uh, things that affect everyday lives of trans people in particular. Um, and uh, we, if we don't have, sometimes if we don't have the, the, the input from EU, we won't have uh, any success in terms of national level. So we, we always need to bear in mind that sometimes it's bottom up, but many, many times this top bottom approach that works. So it's the international pressure that makes a country to change and amend the, the, their legislation. So we need the institutions for this. We need the European Parliament. We need the political parties, all of them. Um, to tackle and to, and to hold their own uh, institutions and member states accountable for, for progress or for uh, the crackdown that it's happening. This is a very important conversation to be continued. Marta, thank you so much for talking thank to me on Liberty. Thank you again for having me.